Okay, next week we're going to begin uh, reading the Odyssey. The Odyssey tells the story of one of the Greeks named Odysseus. After fighting uh, against Troy for 10 years, after they win and they sack the city and they kill the men and enslave the women, uh, the Greeks make their way home and they each live in a different part of Greece. However, Odysseus uh, accidentally pisses off Poseidon, god of the sea. And so Poseidon makes his journey a very, very hard journey home. They fight at Troy for 10 years, and it takes Odysseus another 10 years to get home. So the Odyssey is the story of what happens to him during those 10 years. Uh, but that's actually only half the story. The other half of the story follows Odysseus's son, Telemachus, who is back home. And it's been nine, eight or nine years. Sorry, it's been 18 or 19 years since his father left for Troy. And so now he's starting to get worried. Another reason why he's worried about his father is because when his father is not away, a hundred and one men have been pursuing his mother, Penelope. Uh, and these suitors, Zui Chouzi, have been have taken over their palace, are eating their food, are like partying every day, waiting to see if Penelope will finally give up on Odysseus and choose one of them to marry. And so uh, Telemachus gets really worried about this. Like they're going to run out of food soon. Maybe his mother will give in one day. He really wants to find out what happened to his dad. So the other half of the story is that Telemachus goes around Greece asking for news of the Trojan warriors. Uh, did they win? Did they lose? Where is his father? Is he coming home? The Odyssey actually begins with this second story. Uh, we follow Telemachus going to Greece and asking about the the uh, result of the war. And the people that he meets all tell him that the Greeks won, but that on their way home, something bad happened to this person, something bad happened to that person, and nobody knows what happened to Odysseus. It's only after four or five books following him around that we suddenly jump back to Odysseus. And when we get to Odysseus, He's stuck on an island. All of his men are dead. All of his ships have been destroyed. He's alone on an island and he can't leave because, again, Poseidon is angry at him and so does not give him any wind. And without wind, he can't make his ships sail back to Greece. Uh, finally, some things happen. Uh, he does get to sail back to Greece. When he gets back to Greece, he doesn't reach home. He first reaches a place called Phoenicia. And there at Phoenicia, uh, his hosts, the king of Phoenicia, the king and queen of Phoenicia, uh, treat him properly like a guest. In ancient Greek um, culture, anytime someone shows up at your door, you will have an obligation. You have to first let them clean up, then feed them, then give them wine, and then finally ask the person, who are you, why are you here? And so the Phoenicians treat Odysseus well, and when they ask him, who are you and why are you here? He says, I am Odysseus, this is what happened to me. And then finally, we the reader find out what happened to Odysseus. So it's actually a flashback structure, Dao uh, Shufa. So when we read the selection that I have chosen for you, you will notice that it is put in quotation marks on the in hao mian. And this is because Odysseus is telling his story to the Phoenicians. Therefore, we should also remember that this is what happened to him according to him. In the Iliad, everything was like from the poet's perspective, and the poet knows the story. But in this part of the Odyssey, uh, the previous things that happened to Odysseus are from his own perspective. He is entertaining his hosts with his story. He himself has become a kind of poet. So how much should we trust his story? 
And with that gray area, we can step into the world of fantasy. Because what Odysseus tells his hosts is incredible. He goes to place after place, and everywhere he goes, monsters, inhuman people, giants, cannibals, sirens, various kinds of weird stuff happens to him. Witches, magic, angry gods, everything. Uh, this is the most famous part of the Odyssey, when Odysseus tells his hosts about all of these weird things. Um, so uh, we're going to spend three weeks on the Odyssey. The first week, uh, the first two weeks will be about these stories. But the third week will be about the ending of the poem, or near the ending. Odysseus finally arrives home, uh, but he's been gone so long he doesn't know what uh, what's happening in his home. He's not sure if he can still trust his wife. Uh, so instead of walking into his own home, he goes around in secret to find out uh, if he's still safe. Uh, so that will be the third week. Now, a lot of stuff happens in this poem, and we don't have time to talk about all of it. So uh, you can read the short version in the mythology book, it's under the Adventures of Odysseus on page 291. This chapter covers everything except for one short story. I'm not quite sure why the author uh, separated that other story, but the other story is actually quite famous. It's when Odysseus uh, meets Cyclops, or the Cyclops Polyphemus. Uh, so you can read that as part of the chapter on uh, the Cyclops Polyphemus on page 105. So Polyphemus gets an entire chapter to himself, but Odysseus is only part of his story. So like, if you read the adventures of Odysseus, uh, when it gets to the story of the Cyclops, the book tells you, we already talked about that, please go read that chapter. So anyway. Um, now, if you look at the handout, okay, if you look at the handout, the translation is by someone different. Uh, the Iliad translation is by Stanley Lombardo. It's an older translation, but it's still not hard to understand. But from the same textbook, the translation of the Odyssey is by a guy named Robert, Robert Fagels. And Fagels is a very literary, historical, old kind of guy. His language is not that easy. So I went to look for another translation. The translation we're going to use is by Emily Wilson. She's the first woman to translate the entire Odyssey. And the way that she translated this poem is by turning it into a very proper English poem. When we were reading the Iliad, uh, it looks like a poem, but when you read it out loud, it doesn't really feel like a poem because uh, the, the meter, the rhythm of the original Greek is very different from the English. Emily Wilson decided that she wants to make her translation feel like an English poem. So she translated it into the same meter as Shakespeare. Uh, this is known as blank verse. It's, a pent it's an iambic pentameter. Uh, iambic means that uh, each two syllables is a pair and it sounds like unstressed, stressed, qing ying, zong ying. So if we read the first line, we reach the floating islands of Aeolus. Da, 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 Who is well loved by all the deathless gods. Da, 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 da. This is an uh, iambic line. And uh, there are five of them, right? And each iam is a pair, unstressed and stressed. And there are five of them on each line. That's called pentameter. 
which pentameter just means five. So this is how the entire Odyssey has been translated. So when you read it, it does feel like more traditional English poetry. The other uh, special thing to note about this translation is that because Emily Wilson chose this meter, the words that she uses are often shorter and easier words. If you use lots of long words, it's hard to fit them into the meter of the poem, so she often chooses easier words. Um, so it ends up that her translation is much easier to understand. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait, so she turned a longer Greek poem into a shorter English poem, and she uses easier words. Are we missing anything? Has anything been cut from the original poem? And the answer is yes. There's no such thing as a perfect translation. What has been cut from the original? Mostly it's a lot of the things that have to do with oral literature. If you remember last week, we talked about some signs that what we're reading was not first written down. It was first performed and only later written down. So things like repetition, uh, things like uh, the extremely detailed family histories have been shortened, not deleted, just shortened. Uh, and so when we read it, it actually does feel more like written literature. Now, uh, one last thing I want to point out about this version is that the translator is very, very helpful because at the end of each book, she inserts a summary of what just happened. So at the top of page 109, this long block is a summary of book nine. And if you turn to page 122, The bottom of 122 is a summary of book 10. Now, of course, a summary will leave out many important details, but if you are if you get lost while you're reading, or if you wake up Monday morning and you realize you can't finish, you can use the summary to help you. Um, for this entire class, if you wake up and you realize you can't finish that week's reading, I encourage you to look at my PowerPoint. The PowerPoint files have all been uploaded to Moodle. The five questions that I choose each week are questions that I think are important about the reading. So if you get lost or you can't finish, you can use my questions to guide you and maybe get through the reading a little faster. Uh, OK, so for next week, please finish book 10. The week after, you will read book 11 and a little bit of book 12. And then uh, the week after that, you will read book 16. And then you can take the midterm. OK, questions? Do you have questions about the Odyssey? If you get lost about the Iliad also, you can go and read the mythology book. There's a chapter on everything before Troy, and a chapter on everything that happens during Troy. It's all there if you need help. OK, so if you don't have questions about that, let's jump back to the Iliad and we'll uh, talk about this week's reading in more detail. So page 173. Um, let's look on the previous page, actually, page 158. Uh, the ending of the of this book, 
and then it has the short summary of stuff that it skips. And then it says book 18. Oh, sorry, uh, let's look at the summary. The summary uh, after the ending. Hector stripped Achilles' divine armor from Patroclus' corpse. So remember, Patroclus dies wearing Achilles' armor. Uh, so Hector take, steals Patroclus' armor. Uh, then they fight for the body. The Greeks win the body, uh, but the Trojans are pursuing them. So it's like the Greeks fight and fight, and they snatch the body and then run. And the Trojans are pursuing them. Uh, then it, book 18, the textbook calls it the Shield of Achilles. And let me tell you briefly what this book is about. Achilles said he wouldn't fight, but he let Patroclus wear his armor so that the Trojans might be afraid because they might think it's Achilles. Now that Patroclus is dead, the Trojans have Achilles' armor. But now that Patroclus is dead, Achilles does want to fight. So he needs new armor. He needs a new weapon. He needs a new shield. So he asks his mother to go up to Olympus and ask the gods for new armor. And she goes and she asks the god of metalworking and craft, Hephaestus, to create for her son new armor and a new shield. And of course, because the gods make it, it's the most powerful armor, the most powerful shield. And most of book 18 is spent describing Achilles' shield. You might be thinking, it's a shield. How long can you talk about a shield? It turns out you can talk about it for a long time. If you look at my notes on page 173, uh, that is a drawing of Achilles' new shield. And you'll see that it's a... It's a scene within a scene within a scene. Like the whole shield is like a huge painting. Uh, experts usually agree that it would be impossible to actually make this shield. It would be too big. It's part of the legend of Achilles uh, using armor given by the gods. Okay, so Achilles gets his new armor. Agamemnon apologizes to him for stealing his uh, captive woman and Achilles starts fighting and he keeps fighting and he keeps winning. Nobody can stop him. He fights the river. We talked about this last week. He wins against the river. Finally, uh, as he is about to reach Troy, uh, Apollo helps the Trojans again. Apollo pretends to be Hector and runs in a different direction. And Achilles follows Apollo. And at the beginning of book 22, uh, that's where we begin. So let's take a look at this. Book 22, The Death of Hector. Everywhere you looked in Troy, exhausted soldiers glazed with sweat like winded deer. To be winded means sang chi buje xia chi. Leaned on the walls, cooling down and slaking their thirst. So they're drinking lots of water, lots of wine. Outside, the Greeks formed up close to the wall, locking their shields. In the dead air between the Greeks and Troy's western gate, destiny had Hector pinned, waiting for death. So Hector is stuck between the Greeks and the Trojan wall. Then Apollo called back to Achilles. Remember, Achilles is chasing Apollo. So Apollo called back to Achilles, Son of Peleus, you're fast on your feet, but you'll never catch me, man chasing God. Or are you too raging mad to notice I'm a god? Don't you care about fighting the Trojans anymore? You've chased them back into their town, but now you've veered off from here. You'll never kill me. You don't hold my doom. And the shining sprinter, Achilles, replies, That was a dirty trick, Apollo, turning me away from the wall like that. I could have ground half of Troy face down in the dirt. Now you've robbed me of my glory and saved them easily because you have no retribution to fear, because the gods cannot be killed. I swear I'd make you pay if I could. Um, 
the gods are immortal, but some of the gods can be hurt. In the Iliad, Ares, the god of war, and Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and desire, are both hurt in battle, which is something you may not expect that a human fighting a god could actually hurt a god. Uh, unless you play the video game God of War, in which case you can actually beat the god. But Apollo is not vulnerable to humans. Uh, so Apollo says, na 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 na, goes away. Uh, Achilles says, uh, err, and then his mind opened to the clear space before him. So like he once again saw that he's not chasing anything. It's a clear space before him. And he was off toward the town, moving like a thoroughbred. A thoroughbred is, is a, a horse of good breeding. Ipi Halma. Stretching it out over the plain for the final sprint home. So like a, a good horse almost finishing a race. Achilles lifting his knees as he lengthened his stride. So he's running faster. Okay, and so he's running back to Troy, to the wall of Troy. Priam saw him first with his old man's eyes. A single point of light on Troy's dusty plain. So Priam is standing on the wall of Troy looking out, and he sees a single point of light, and he knows that this is Achilles. Why is Achilles shining? Why is he light? He's not naked, right? He's wearing armor. He's wearing a helmet. And so the sunlight reflecting off of him is very bright and shiny. Uh, and so then we have a comparison of uh, this shining Achilles compared to a star, Sirius, Tian Lang Xing. You guys should know this one also. Sirius rises late in the dark liquid sky on summer nights Star of stars, because Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. Orion's dog, they called it. Uh, uh, so like if you know anything about the sky, Sirius is over there, and over here you have the constellation Orion, Liahu. So like this guy is a hunter, and Sirius is like his hunting dog. So Sirius is called Orion's dog. Brightest of all, but an evil portent. Bringing heat and fevers to suffering humanity. And the footnote tells us this is because uh, in Greece, it rises in late summer, the hottest time of the year. So if at night you can see Sirius, in Greece it's going to get very hot. Achilles' bronze gleamed like this as he ran. And the old man groaned and beat his head with his hands and stretched out his arms to his beloved son, Hector, who had taken his stand before the western gate. Before just means in front of. Determined to meet Achilles in combat. Priam's voice cracked as he pleaded. Hector, my boy, you can't face Achilles alone like that without any support. You'll go down in a minute. He's too much for you, son. He won't stop at anything. Oh, if only the gods loved him as I do. Vultures and dogs would be gnawing his corpse. Okay, so what is he saying? If the gods loved Achilles like I loved Achilles, then Achilles would already be dead. In other words, Priam hates Achilles. Vultures is tuing. Does that make sense? Yeah? Like his love for Achilles is negative. Then some grief might pass from my heart. In other words, maybe then I would feel a little bit better if Achilles were dead. So many fine sons he's taken from me. Remember, Priam had 50 sons, and most of them were killed by Achilles. So many fine sons he's taken from me, killed or sold them as slaves in the islands. Two of them now, Lakun 
and Polydorus, I can't see with the Trojans safe in town. Lyothoe's boys, if the Greeks have them, we'll ransom them with the gold and silver old Altes gave us. So in the Greek tradition, if you are captured, uh, then your family will often buy you back. So that's what the ransom is, Sujing. But if they're dead and gone down to Hades, there will be grief for myself and the mother who bore them. The rest of the people won't mourn so much unless you go down at Achilles' hands. Now he's talking to Hector. So he's saying, I have suffered because so many of my sons have died. But when you, if you, Hector, die, then all of Troy will suffer. Because Hector is the great protector of Troy. So come inside the wall, my boy. Live to save the men and women of Troy. Don't just hand Achilles the glory and throw your life away. Show some pity for me before I go out of my mind with grief and Zeus finally destroys me in my old age after I have seen all the horrors of war. My son's butchered. A butcher is, in, in Chinese, is tu fu. So butchered is, I think, tu sa would be better. My son's butchered. My daughter's dragged off, raped. Bed chambers plundered. Plundered means stolen. Uh, ransacked. Bei, uh, cao kong, cao kong. Infants dashed to the ground. So, uh, like in war, uh, especially for the royal family, if you don't want the enemy to have a future king, you would take the royal family's babies and throw them on the ground to kill them. That's what this is. Infants dashed to the ground in this terrible war. My son's wives abused by murderous Greeks. And one day some Greek soldier will stick me with cold bronze. Bronze is Huang Tong. So in other words, like a uh, sword. Will stick me with cold bronze and draw the life from my limbs. Limbs is shi zhi. So take my life away. And the dogs that I fed at my table, my watchdogs, will drag me outside and eat my flesh raw, crouched in my doorway, lapping my blood. Lap To lap is like if you ever seen a dog drink water. To lap, that's the kind of... Uh, the word lap describes how dogs drink water. So like this is a very violent image. This is what he's saying. This is what will happen to me and to my family if you, Hector, die and we can't protect our city. Uh, but in fact, we, we saw a similar image last week when Hector was talking to his wife. He's saying, like, uh, I hope we don't lose this war. Otherwise, like, you will be dragged away and our son will be sold to slavery. We've seen a similar image before. When a young man is killed in war, even though his body is slashed with bronze, he lies there beautiful in death, noble. But when the dogs maraud an old man's head, maraud also just means uh, plunder, ransack. When, a, when the dogs maraud an old man's head, griming his white hair and beard in private parts, there's no human fate more pitiable. Grime, ugo, here used as a verb, to make dirty, his white hair and beard and private parts. There's no human fate more pitiable. Like, notice he keeps talking about his dogs, right? He's like, when I die, my dogs will eat me. Uh, you have to remember, this was like at least... 800 years BC. So this is at least, like this is around 3,000 years ago. At that time, humans were not as close with dogs as they are today. Um, in early human history, humans and dogs were, or I guess humans and like uh, almost dogs, they're kind of like wolves, right? They're not entirely pets. 
uh, at the time were more equals. They were not really owner, a master and pet. So the idea is that when I die, my dogs will not be so loyal and, and as animals, they will eat my body. So this is Priam's speech. And the old man pulled the white hair from his head, but did not persuade Hector. Pulling hair from the head is a traditional image of grief, I thought. His mother then, wailing, sobbing, laid open her bosom, and holding out a breast, spoke through her tears. Hector, my child, if ever I've soothed you with this breast, remember it now, son, and have pity on me. So she's using the most basic maternal connection between mother and son to try to persuade Hector to come back to his mother. Don't pit yourself against that madman, Achilles. Come inside the wall. If Achilles kills you, I will never get to mourn you and uh, laid out on a bier. Oh, my sweet blossom. This is a good time to talk about uh, what the Greeks do to their dead. So if a Greek person or a Trojan person dies and the family gets the body back, they die by cremation. So they would cut down trees to build what's known as a funeral pyre. Uh, so they stack uh, the wood up high. They put the person's belongings and cherished possessions on the wood. And then they add like dead cows, dead sheep as a sacrifice. And then they put the person's body on top and they light the fire and everything burns to heaven. Uh, so that's what is called a funeral beer. I will never get to mourn you laid out on a beer, oh my sweet blossom. Nor will Andromache, Hector's wife, your beautiful wife. But far from us both, dogs will eat your body by the Greek ships. So uh, he Hecuba, Hector's mother, makes the same kind of argument, or I guess the same kind of plea. Don't fight. If you fight, you will die. Uh, his father emphasizes that without Hector, Troy will fall. His mother emphasizes without her son, uh, Andromache, Hector's wife, will uh, suffer and your body will be eaten uh, by dogs near the Greek ships on the beach. So it's a more intimate family kind of perspective. So the two of them pleaded with their son, but did not persuade him or touch his heart. Hector held his ground as Achilles' bulk loomed larger. So like this is the image, right? He's, he's standing in front of the wall. He's looking ahead. In the far distance is a line of Greek soldiers. And from those soldiers, Achilles is running over to him, getting larger and larger. He waited as a snake waits, tense and coiled. Coil is a drenchilai. As a man approaches its lair in the mountains. A lair is a home for animals. Venom, dusu, in its fangs, and poison in its heart. Glittering eyes glaring from the rocks. So this is comparing Hector to a snake preparing to defend his home. So Hector waited, leaning his polished shield against one of the towers in Troy's bulging wall. But his heart was troubled with brooding thoughts. Uh, we talked about this next passage. So let's skip to line 126. No, that's 125. The next stanza. But... But what if I lay down all my weapons? Bossed shield. Oh, okay, so the word bossed today in English is embossed. It means uh, you do jing de, or du ying de, something. 
some kind of metal on top. Boss shield, heavy helmet, prop my spear against the wall, and go meet Achilles. Promise him we'll surrender Helen and everything Paris brought back with her in his ship's holds to Troy. A ship's hold is a place on a ship where you put things. That was the beginning of this war. Give all of it back to the sons of Atreus. The sons of Atreus are Agamemnon and Menelaus. Menelaus is Helen's rightful husband. Agamemnon is the leader of the Greek army. They're brothers. So what if I give all of it back to the sons of Atreus and divide everything else in the town with the Greeks and swear a great oath not to hold anything back but share it all equally, all the treasure in Troy's citadel? So in other words, what if I surrender? But why am I talking to myself like this? I can't go out there unarmed. Achilles will cut me down in cold blood if I take off my armor and go out to meet him naked like a woman. So then he remembers Achilles is really, really angry. Probably would not accept his surrender. This is no time for talking the way a boy and a girl whisper to each other from oak tree or rock. A boy and a girl with all their sweet talk. Better to lock up in mortal combat uh, as soon as possible and see to whom God on Olympus grants the victory. Thus spoke Hector. So this is Hector's speech, and he has decided to fight Achilles. And Achilles closed in like the helmeted god of war himself. Uh, let's let's skip to. There's one passage I want you to notice. Um, so we already talked about uh, Zeus hesitates to let Hector die, but Athena convinces him he should follow fate. But there is a moment when uh, fate actually happens. On page 179. So Achilles has been chasing Hector around Troy for three times. Line 235. But when they reach the springs, the fourth time, Father Zeus stretched out his golden scales, Bang Chen, and uh, Tianping, and placed on them two agonizing deaths, one for Achilles and one for Hector. When he held the beam, Hector's doom sank down toward Hades, and Phoebus Apollo left him. So the moment that fate actually happens is when Zeus holds out his scales and one of their lives sinks down toward the earth. And the person whose lives sinks down is going to die. When that happens, even Apollo gives up. Remember, Apollo is helping Hector give him energy to run. But even at that moment, Apollo leaves Hector and Hector is left to die. So if we skip to page 181, Uh, after Apollo leaves, Athena comes and pretends to Hector that she is another of his brothers named uh, Deiphobus. She's pretending like Deiphobus came out of Troy to help Hector fight. But at the crucial moment, Athena disappears. So this is line 321. He shouted to Deiphobus, but Deiphobus was nowhere in sight. It was then that Hector knew in his heart what had happened and said to himself, I hear the gods calling me to my death. Can you imagine feeling that? I hear the gods calling me to my death. 
I thought I had a good man here with me, Daiphobus, but he's still on the wall. Athena tricked me. Death is closing in and there's no escape. Zeus and Apollo must have chosen this long ago, even though they used to be on my side. My fate is here, but I will not perish without some great deed that future generations will remember. So even at the last moment, Hector still fights knowing that he will die. Okay, uh, read book 10 of the Odyssey and we'll see you next week.